All right, well, thank you for uh, coming so early in the morning. It reminds me of a famous story about Sidney Coleman, who was once asked if he would teach a class at 10 o'clock in the morning at Harvard. And he said, I don't think I can do that. And they said, why? Is it too early for you to get up? And he said, no, it's too late for me to stay up. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not that bad, though. Um, all right, so the lecture today is mainly going to be math. But maybe towards the end, I'll illustrate it with some examples from string theory. And if not today, then the next lecture will have some more connections with conformal field theory and string theory. Um, so today, I want to illustrate the idea of um, constructing functions which are invariant under some group action. by averaging over the group. And I'll illustrate this, not necessarily with complete uh, detail, with uh, several examples. So the first example, which I won't fully develop this way, but just to show you it could be done, are just the familiar trig functions, which are associated with the group of integers because they're periodic functions. The second example will be elliptic functions, where the group is two copies of the integers. So here, for example, the group just acts to take x to x plus n. Here, the action will be on a complex variable taking z to z plus some n omega 1 plus m omega 2 for n and m integers. And in developing um, elliptic functions, we will naturally be led to modular functions. And we'll find them in a, a particular formulation, but we'll see that that formulation is equivalent to constructing group acting in the way that I described earlier, where a, b, c, d are all integers, and the determinant of that matrix is equal to 1. And I'm not sure quite how much time I'm going to have later on, but we'll see that there are also some uh, modular functions that can be constructed by doing a kind of average here, but in a more complicated way. And things called punk or Rademacher. Also based on this principle, but uh, involve a little more, well, extra complications. Um, I should also ask if there are questions from the last lecture. No? OK. All right, so this is probably not the way that you ever, uh, that you learned about trigonometric functions, but let's consider uh, the following. So in order to apply this kind of technique, of course, we could choose complicated functions to average to try to get these kinds of functions, but the simpler a function we choose, the simpler kind of analysis we'll have. So I'm going to just consider a power, a negative power of x, So n here is a positive integer. And let's average this function over all the integers. That is, average this function shifted by an integer. So r will be an integer running from minus infinity to plus infinity. And we take x, and we shift it by r for all integers r. And we take that to the minus n. And this is a kind of average 
over the integers of x to the minus n. Now, clearly, if this sum converges and defines a sensible function, then this function Uh, sorry, I should use some other letter here. Is invariant under shifts by integers that it's a periodic function with period one. So the only question is whether this sum um, converges or not. So let me just recall a few basic facts about convergence of sums. So a series of this form is convergent and equal to S if the partial sums I'll call S sub n, um, converge to S as n goes to infinity. And we say that a series converges absolutely if the sum of the absolute magnitudes of the coefficients So when, it's, when a series converges absolutely, that certainly implies that it con converges. And it also implies that you can rearrange terms in the sum without changing the sum. But if a series, but you can have series that converge but don't converge absolutely. But then you have to specify the order in which you sum the terms in the series. And this is a sort of you know, mathematical subtlety that often we don't need to worry about. But in this case, we actually do. So in this particular example, it's fairly straightforward to show that this sum converges absolutely for n equal to 2. So uh, let's focus on the hard case. Of n equals 1. So epsilon 1 of x does not converge absolutely. One way to think about this is you may remember that there's an integral test for convergence, that if um, a sum from n to infinity of terms in a sum uh, converge if and only if the integral of that function from n to infinity converges. So when we look at epsilon 1 of x, 
this is like log x if we, if we do the integral, and that's not going to converge. So in order to define what this means, we have to specify an order to do the sum. And so let's do that. So we want this to be, we'll define this to be the as n goes to infinity of the sum from r equals minus n to plus n, 1 over x plus r, which is specifying an order. It says you sum all the terms from minus n to plus n, and then you try to take the limit as n goes to infinity. And just writing this out, the r equals 0 term is 1 over x. And then we have a sum from r equals 1 to n, 1 over x plus r plus 1 over x minus r. And just combining those last two terms, that's equal to the limit 1 over x plus 2x times the sum r equals 1 to n, 1 over x squared minus r squared. Now, this way of writing it now gives us a sum which does converge absolutely because uh, if you want the coefficient c of n goes like 1 over n squared, and you know that sums where the coefficients go like 1 over n squared at large n are convergent sums. Yes? I have, I have rearranged the terms. I've, I've defined the function. So in other words, I've defined the function by specifying a particular ordering of sum, doing the sum. And I claim that now with this, well, with this ordering, this defines a convergent series. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you who in a few minutes, who told me to do this. Um, OK, so if I were really going to continue along this path, I would now study the higher epsilon n. I would study the properties of this. And I would you know, work out various properties of this, quantity, this function, epsilon 2x, et cetera purely from this definition. But I'm not going to do that because I don't think it's really the point of this course. I wanted to illustrate something. So I'm just going to give you a few results and tell you where you can read more. All right, so you can show, and I'll give you a reference in just a minute, that the first derivative of this function is equal to minus epsilon 1 squared minus pi squared. It clearly has a simple pole at x equals 0. And the unique solution to this equation with the simple pole is that epsilon 1 of x is equal to pi times the cotangent of pi x. And in fact, starting from this point of view and looking at these higher epsilons, you can derive all of the standard trigonometric functions. So for example, you could define a quantity e of x, which is epsilon 1 of x 
plus i pi over epsilon 1 of x minus i pi. And you would find that this is nothing other than e to the 2 pi i x, from which you would extract the sine and cosine by taking real and imaginary parts. So in other words, although this is not how you've usually seen it done, you could define all trigonometric functions just by the idea of taking a simple function and averaging, averaging a bit over the integers in order to s obtain a function which is periodic. And there's a very nice little book that explains how to do this and gives the historical context by Andre Ve, and it's called elliptic functions according to Eisenstein and Kronecker. And it's kind of a little historical introduction to a certain era in mathematics and the development of these ideas. And it's probably also one of the few books by Andre Ve that any physicist would feel like they could try to read because most of them are very high level. Um, I remember somebody saying that there was a book by Andre Ve on number theory, but the only numbers in the book are the page numbers. I mean, it's, you know, it's all. So, so you can develop trigonometric functions this way, um, but I'm not going to do that. But let me, I will mention a couple of things, nonetheless, just following up on this. So first of all, an exercise. So this is maybe the most satisfactory because he, he derives this equation simply from the definition and then everything follows. But if you want to see, if you're, if you're allowed to sort of guess the answer in advance, you can show that pi times the cotangent of pi times is equal to this sum that I wrote down. By showing that the difference of the left-hand side and the right-hand side is um, a holomorphic function. Um, and bounded Hence, the difference has to be a constant, and then show that the constant is, in fact, equal to 0, so that the left and right-hand sides are equal. So if you're willing to kind of guess a little bit, you could have guessed this identity, and then you can prove it by using some straightforward complex analysis. Now, another thing that you can do from this definition uh, is to derive an identity, which we will use soon when we talk about modular forms. So in particular, since this function that I called epsilon 1, I'll call it now z, thinking it as a function of a complex variable, we can find a uh, Fourier series expansion of it. In terms of the variable q, which is e to the 2 pi i z. In the last lecture, I was usually calling the argument here tau. I guess I'll sometimes use tau when I'm thinking of modular functions and such like that, but sometimes I'll use z if I'm just thinking of a more generic complex variable. 
All right, so to do this, it's just straightforward. By definition, this is um, times uh, factor of 2i, cosine pi z over sine pi z. And I can write this in terms of Q. And then I can pull out a factor of uh, square root of Q, top and bottom, and write this as Q plus 1 over Q minus 1. And then for Q less than 1, I can expand this denominator as 1 plus Q plus Q squared plus dot, dot, dot. So combining these together, I get this is pi i minus 2 pi i times the sum m equals 0 to infinity of Q to the m. So that's a Fourier expansion. Um, this assumes that Q is less than 1. So in particular, this expansion does not apply at z equals 0, where there's a pole, because Q is equal to 1 there. But as long as the Q has magnitude less than 1, then this is a legitimate expansion. And this gives us a Fourier series decomposition of this cotangent function. Another comment um, to make this perhaps look a little more familiar is that this formula, or the formula that I had for the cotangent, uh, also follows from Euler's formula for the sine function, that is that there's a product formula that says the sine of pi x is pi x times the product n equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus x squared over n squared. Um, if you take the log of both sides and then take the derivative after taking the log. Uh, so clearly here we get d by dx of log sine pi x, but that's just um, uh, cosine over sine times pi, so that's just pi times the cotangent of pi x. And on the other side, we have d by dx of log pi plus log x plus some log 1 minus x squared over n squared. And that gives us 1 over x plus, if you do a slight manipulation, we get this. And that was our original definition of pi times cotangent in terms of this averaging over the integers. So the main thing uh, that I wanted to do is just e expose you to the idea that there's a very natural way of thinking of trigonometric functions in terms of a group. And that group is just the group of integers. And you can construct them by averaging over that group, which generates for you periodic functions. 
And you could go on and you could study other sorts of identities. You could uh, you know, do all of, all of trigonometric functions this way. And it also gives you a way of naturally generalizing them because there are various kinds of, um, once you think of things in terms of groups, there are natural modifications involving characters of the groups and things like that. It's a very powerful way of thinking about functions um, which make certain constructions more natural than they might otherwise be. OK, so um, I wanted to do that in a, in a slightly more familiar example, just to show you something that you know, but you know, written in a way that might not be familiar, before generalizing it. So I now want to take that same idea where we tried to make functions that were periodic under the integers uh, to construct functions that are periodic in two directions. So in the last lecture, I introduced a lattice where I chose two complex numbers omega 1 and omega 2. I don't necessarily have to choose them in the same quadrant. I'm just doing it for ease of drawing pictures. And then I consider the lattice that's generated by translation by any integer combination of these two vectors. Sorry, my artistic ability is kind of limited, but anyway, I think you get the idea. So we have a lattice, L omega 1, omega 2, which consists of, if you want, all points uh, n omega, or n1 omega 1 plus n2 omega 2 with n1 and n2 integers. Now, there's one thing I could do, but it's not what I want to do. That is, I, I could make functions that are invariant under translations by omega 1 and omega 2 just by writing down uh, a double Fourier series in omega 1 and omega 2 with two different variables, x and y. That gives you a, a function which is periodic, but of course, it's not going to have any, it's not going to be holomorphic. It's just going to be a function of the real and imaginary parts of a complex variable, but it's not going to be a holomorphic function. So what we really want to know is, can we make a holomorphic function that is invariant under this action of the integers that corresponds to this lattice. So in other words, can we find a function of z, which is holomorphic, such that f of z plus n1 omega 1 plus n2 omega 2 is equal to f of z? And the answer to this question is no. You can't make such a thing. And the reason is pretty simple. If the function is holomorphic, then if I look at any point, let's say, z naught in this little fundamental parallelogram, f of z naught for z naught in this little parallelogram is a bounded function because holomorphic functions are bounded in any finite region. If it's invariant under this shift, then I can give you the function at any other point by translating. 
So in other words, this relation determines f of z in all of the complex plane. And in particular, this tells me that f is bounded in the complex plane. But by Louisville's theorem, or whoever's theorem it is, this implies that f is a constant. So actually, this no is not quite right. The answer is yes, but only if the function is a constant. And somehow, constant functions are not very interesting. Yeah. OK, well, you can say, I guess that didn't work. But whenever it does, something doesn't work, you should always try the next best thing. So maybe we can make f almost holomorphic. Meaning it has one simple pole in this little parallelogram. So that wouldn't be, you know, quite as good as holomorphic, but maybe there's just one point where it has a singularity and then everything else uh, would be okay. However, if that were the case, then we can simply compute the contour integral around this little parallelogram. And that has to be 2 pi i times the residue of f at z naught. And if it has a simple pole, then this residue has to be non-zero. But this integral is 0 because the value here and here and the values here and here are equal because of the periodicity. And so the line integral of f around this curve has to be 0 by the periodicity. So we failed again. But the failure also suggests the solution because, remember, Cauchy's residue formula relates the line integral around a closed contour to the residue, and the residue depends on the coefficient of 1 over z. But if there was a second order pole, 1 over z squared, that doesn't contribute to Cauchy's residue formula, the integral the integral around a closed curve and closing the origin of dz over z squared is actually 0. And so if we had a second order pole in our function, then maybe we could apply this argument. So that turns out to be what actually works. And holomorphic or a single simple pole can't work for the reasons I've just explained to you. But we can try to have a second order pole. So the simplest thing to try to do then is to try to average the function 1 over z squared, which has a second order pole, over our lattice. So let's do that. So let's look at that sum. So what would we do? Well, we would sum over all elements in this lattice. And then we would shift z by an element of the lattice. And if we're averaging 1 over z squared, we would take 1 over z plus omega for all omega in this lattice and look at that sum. So that's a sum on integers.
And I can write this by picking out the term where n and m is equal to 0 is 1 over z squared plus a sum on integers n and m, which are not both equal to 0. So that's going to be our attempt at finding some function which is not quite holomorphic, but has uh, sort of the simplest pole that it can have compatible with this periodicity, and trying to make sense of it. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't quite work. Um, the problem is, this second term diverges as z goes to 0. And we had hoped that we had picked out the only divergence by picking out this pole and then averaging it, but we haven't completely managed to do that. So the second term at z equals 0 is the sum over this lattice of 1 over lattice point squared. And if we were just summing a single integer, 1 over n squared, that sum would converge. But we're summing pairs of integers. This is the sum on n and m, 1 over n omega 1 plus m omega 2 squared. And that sum diverges, because just think of, think of comparing this to the integral that you would get by summing n and m from some fixed number to infinity. The first sum, turning it into an integral, would give you 1 over this quantity. And then the next one would give you a log. And then the log would be divergent. So in other words, if I put a cutoff on this sum at some large n, there's a log divergence in that, in that cutoff. So this is log divergent. But it's independent of z. So we can do something that's very much like renormalization in quantum field theory, where you subtract a divergence as long as it doesn't you know, sort of affect the physics. Here, the z dependence is not affected by this divergence. So we decide that we'll subtract it. And we therefore define a function one over z squared plus a sum, which is in our lattice, except for the zero point, one over z plus omega squared minus 1 over omega squared. So now, this is convergent at z equals 0. And is periodic with respect to the action of shifts by elements of our lattice, because of the way that it's constructed. And this function is known as the Weierstrass function. And this symbol, I believe, is known as backslash WP, um, in case you want to uh, write it in LaTeX. You wouldn't believe how I, I practiced many, many times to try to make that symbol. So this is sort of the basic elliptic function. And um, there's a lot of nice theory that um, follows from analyzing this equation, various differential equations, relations to elliptic curves, and such things. Um, which I'm not going to go into, 
But I will just say that this function, the Weierstrass function, is a meromorphic function on the complex plane. It's invariant under z goes to z plus omega for omega in our lattice. And as a result, has double poles at lattice points. In other words, we saw that it has a double pole at the origin, where it goes like 1 over z squared, and it was constructed to be invariant under shifts by the lattice. So at every lattice vector, it has a double pole. That's really a bad lattice, but anyway. All right, so here's an exercise. Yeah. Yeah. So the last thing you just described was essentially infinity. Um, by itself, it's infinity. But the difference between these two quantities summed over the lattice makes sense. Right. So, it, yeah, I mean, as z, as z goes to zero, these two terms cancel each other out. Yeah. And, it, and at any z that's non-zero, um, I guess I can expand this. So if I have some, um, you want to know what the prescription is for making this finite? My question is, for non-zero z, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, and somehow I'm feeling stupid while I'm standing up here in front of you and not thinking of the right answer. But I guess my first inclination would be to say that I at least for z near the origin, I could expand this in powers of z, and the first term in that expansion would just be the 1 over omega squared, and I would cancel that and then be left with something that was finite. Um, yeah, I think I could actually do that throughout that, f that whole first parallelogram, um, because in that parallelogram, z over omega, uh, is less than one in magnitude, so I think I could I could expand use that expansion to define this. Um, there's probably a better answer than that, but I'm sure I'm not thinking of what it is at the moment. Does it actually mean that the first term alone is directed to all That's what I seem to be suggesting, but I'm not quite sure it's true, so I don't want to say yes. <laughs> um, I don't, does anybody know what the right way is? Okay. Uh, I, will, I will try to investigate this question and give you a better answer. Okay. So nonetheless, that doesn't stop me from asking you a question, which is the following. So an exercise is to show that the derivative of this with respect to z is an odd function of z.
and that it has exactly three zeros mod this lattice at z equals omega 1 over 2, omega 2 over 2, and omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2. All right, I'm now going to do a calculation which maybe answers your question, but um, All right, so let me now look at the Taylor series <coughs> expansion um, of the Weierstrass z function. And I think this answers your question, but. Um, Let's see. I'm not somehow, okay, I, I'm, I'm not quite getting the, there we go. So there's a pole at 1 over z squared, and when I subtract 1 over z squared, I'm left with a sum over non-zero lattice vectors. 1 over omega minus z squared, 1 over minus 1 over omega squared. Now, indeed, what I said when I was stumbling around in response to your question was um, we can expand this at small z And so this makes sense provided that z over omega is less than 1. And we don't include in this sum the 0 vector. So um, I guess in the fundamental, fundamental parallelogram, this is true. And then by periodicity, I can, uh, well, I can. Well, anyway, so it's, the, the function is periodic, so if I know what's happening in the fundamental par parallelogram, I know what's happening everywhere. And in this little fundamental parallelogram, I can use this expansion. So, um, if we look at this sum, there are sums there are terms in the sum where r is odd and there are sums where r is even. And when r is odd, we always have lattice vectors omega and minus omega, and they give opposite contributions. So this sum can be restricted just to even r because the other terms vanish, they cancel each other. Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, 
Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so this expansion is valid as long as the magnitude of z over omega is less than 1. No, this is the expansion of 1 over 1 minus z over w squared. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm now choosing R seven and writing. And I will define this to be the sum from k equals 1 to infinity to k plus 1 of a quantity that I'll call g2k plus 2, which depends on omega times z to the 2k where g2k is the sum on non-zero lattice points. I'm dropping the subscripts on the lattice just because I'm tired of writing them. Of 1 over omega to the 2k plus 2. All right, so before I analyze this anymore, let me just say briefly what we've done here. Sorry? Um, so in the sum over there, I had a sum on R. Uh, Uh, so the, I had a sum on R, sorry, uh, I had 1 over, sorry, I'm being a little sloppy here. I had 1 over omega minus z squared is 1 over omega squared sum R equals 0 to infinity, R plus 1, z to the R over omega to the R. All right, the R equals 0 term here is 1 over omega squared plus sum r equals 1 to infinity of stuff. Then what I wanted to look at in the definition of the Weierstrass function was a sum where I had 1 over omega minus z squared minus 1 over omega squared. So this 1 over omega squared cancels that minus 1 over omega squared. And then I'm left with a sum from r equals 1 to infinity. And then in this sum, I set r is equal to 2k because only the even r contributed. So I dropped that term without quite saying what I was doing. My apologies. And OK, so we then end up with this expansion. All right, so what we've done, we're trying to make a function which is periodic with respect to this lattice.
we're thinking of this function as a function of z, but of course, really, it's a function not only of z, but of omega 1 and omega 2, because I'm specifying a lattice under which it's invariant. And that lattice requires specifying two complex numbers to tell me the generators of the lattice. So what this formula does, it gives a Taylor series expansion of this as a function of z with coefficients that are functions of omega 1 and omega 2. So what we're going to see soon is that these functions g 2 k are what are known as Eisenstein series. And they are modular forms. And I'm going to rewrite them and explain how to think of them as group averages and give you some expansions of them and tell you more of their properties. But the idea here is that by trying to make an elliptic function, it secretly depends not only on z, well, not so secretly, but also on the lattice. And when you extract out the lattice dependence, it gives you a, a set of functions, which are going to be modular functions, essentially because they shouldn't depend or should depend in a simple way on doing modular transformations that correspond to changing the basis for the lattice. All right, so I think this is a good place to take a 10 minute break. And so why don't we reconvene at 10 after and I'll tell you a bunch of things about Eisenstein series. There was a, um, hello? Is that, is that, uh, okay. I don't know, it was, uh, is that all right? There was some feedback, but it seems, all right. I don't want, I don't want to do my Jimi Hendrix, interpret my, uh, Jimi Hendrix interpretation. <laughs> no, it's. Uh, is that all right? Can, okay. All right. There was a uh, typo. There should have been a plus two here. Um, I'd also like to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your questions. Even if it's sometimes slightly embarrassing, I can't give you an immediate correct answer. I really like that you're asking questions. It means you're paying attention. And please keep it up. Keep me honest. Correct my typos as well as any other more important errors. Okay, so uh, we have this quantity, G2K plus 2. It's written down there. Rewriting this. We can pull out a factor of omega 2 to the 2k plus 2. And using the notation from the last lecture, where I refer to tau as omega 1 over omega 2. It's the ratio of the two sides of the lattice. 
we can pull out this factor of omega 2 and we're left with this sum like this. Now, as I explained from a kind of physics context, but also true in mathematics, if we're looking at physics or mathematics on a two torus or an elliptic curve where we don't keep track of the scale dependence, then we're allowed to rescale our variables. Omega 2 is non zero. And so it makes sense to simply um, scale things out and define the holomorphic Eisenstein series of weight 2k to be g2k of tau is a sum one over n tau plus m to the 2k. And the Taylor series expansion of the Weierstrass function involves E4, E6, E8, etc. Uh, sorry, G4. The E's will come later. And these are all values of k or 2k for which this sum converges. So there are two facts about these Eisenstein series. I put the word holomorphic in there because they are holomorphic and also because there are things called the Eisenstein series which are not holomorphic and so it's important to distinguish them. So there are in two important facts. The first is that these functions have very nice transformations under modular transformations. In particular, they transform the power of C tau plus D into themselves for transformations in SL2Z. And um, really the reason why they should have such nice transformation properties is that these transformations in the modular group are simply changing the basis of the lattice. And the second, um, well, I'll define this a little bit later, but it means that they are modular forms. of what 2k. And the second fact, which um, is related to the theme that I mentioned to start out the lectures, is that these quantities g2k of tau, these Eisenstein series, can be constructed in a different way than we've constructed them. Namely, they can be constructed from the principle of averaging a simple function over a group. which was the way that we constructed trigonometric functions and the elliptic Weierstrass function. And now we'll see that the, exactly the same idea gives another way of thinking about these Eisenstein series, 
which we've extracted by looking at the Fourier expansion or the Taylor series expansion of the Eisenstein of the virus stress function, but um, we can also understand them from this averaging point of view. The group here will be SL2Z. Yeah, I'll, I'll be more explicit about what I mean by this, but. Okay, to show the first, um, I'm going to use a fact without proving it and, well, one of the, I mean, I guess one of the tensions in trying to, you know, explain anything is that if you try to prove absolutely everything, it takes forever to get anywhere. And so at some point you start skipping a few things here and there. And so occasionally I'm going to skip things without doing the derivation, but I'll try to at least tell you when I'm doing that. Um, you can find this fact explained in, I think, many standard references on modular forms. So I, I'm not going to prove this, but I'm going to use the fact that SL2Z is generated by two transformations. One that's usually called T, which takes tau to tau plus one, or in terms of a two by two matrix, it's one, one, zero, one. And the other transformation is S, which is tau goes to minus one over tau or in terms of a two by two matrix, you can take it to be zero, one, minus one, zero. So what this means is that any element of SL2Z, any two by two matrix of integers with the determinant one, can be written as you know, a word in S and T. So, in particular, if we show that a function has this transformation property under S and has the property under T, then it follows that it has that property under a general element of the modular group. And this simplifies the proof because you only have to check two transformations rather than having to try to check a general transformation like this. So I'm just going to quote this and then use that. So using this, all we need to show is that G2K of tau plus one is equal to G2K of tau, and that G2K of minus one over tau is equal to tau to the 2K, G2K of tau, because that's what this uh, reduces to for either T or S. For T, C is zero, D is one, and so this factor is just one. For S, um, C is minus one, and D is equal to zero, so this factor becomes tau or minus tau to the 2K, which is the same as tau to the 2K. All right, so let's try to check those. All right, so G2K of minus one over tau You know, I think I'm going to, uh, I should have done this long ago. If I put a sum with a prime on it, that stands for this combination, which I'm getting tired of writing, plus it uses up the chalk. Um, okay, so. Using that notation, G2K of minus one over tau is equal to some prime. Now I'm supposed to replace tau. 
So I have minus n over tau plus m to the 2k. But this is a sum prime tau to the 2k over minus n plus m tau to the 2k. Now I can just let n prime equals minus m, m prime equals minus n, and this is a sum if you want an n prime, m prime. Tau to the 2k over n prime tau plus m prime to the 2k, which is tau to the 2k, g2k of tau. Now the only thing, this, this is very straightforward manipulation, the only thing to note is that we are reordering terms in the sum in doing this, but this is allowed because the sum is absolutely convergent, and so you can reorder terms as you want, and by doing that reordering, we prove this modular transformation law that we wanted to prove. as an exercise, it's even simpler than uh, this demonstration. All right. Now, the other thing I wanted to say was that you can think of these Eisenstein series as constructed from this principle of averaging over a group. And... Um, I will use the transformation law that these obey to motivate the following. I will define what I will call a weight 2k action of the modular group SL2z for any function from the upper half plane to the complex numbers. and for an element gamma of SL2z as follows. I'll write this as F uh, bar gamma of tau is equal to C tau plus D to the minus 2k times F of A tau plus B over C tau plus D. In other words, this says take an element of SL2z and its weight 2k action on a function of tau, which is in the upper half plane, is given by taking the function at A tau plus B over C tau plus D and multiplying it by C tau plus D to the minus 2k. Now, notationally, this is kind of nice because the transformation law for these Eisenstein series can just be written in this simple form. It's simply the statement that they are invariant under this weight 2k action. So our, the modular transformation property, one you know, example of which I worked out over here, can just be written in a little more abstract, simplified notation like this, and instead of saying they transform up to this factor, you could say that they're invariant, but they're invariant with respect to this weight 2k action where you multiply by this factor. Yeah. 
uh, the complex numbers. Sorry? They're maps, yeah, they're, they're functions from the upper half plane. So H is equal to tau, which is complex, such that the imaginary part of tau is positive. So, so, so F is a function from the, from the upper half plane to the complex numbers. Yes, absolutely, and we will encounter one soon. Uh, maybe not today, but certainly uh, tomorrow. And uh, yeah, it's something called the modular J function. And I'll mention the fact that it's connected to the representation of the monster sporadic group. <laughs> it's a wonderful function, but we're not, yeah, but it will take a little while longer to get to it. Absolutely. Okay, so now let me consider something that may sound kind of strange, but now that we've introduced this notation, um, we, I, can, I could ask myself, well, can I, given this, this weight k action of the modular group, can I average some simple function over the group to get a function that's uh, a modular form? So here's a function. One. That's a function from the upper half plane to the complex numbers that takes the value 1 everywhere. Okay, so let's average it over the weight 2k action. Well, the weight 2k action of the modular group on the, on the function 1 is c tau plus e to the minus 2k times the function 1. So, we could consider taking the function 1, this weight tau, and summing it over all, uh, sorry, should put a gamma there and summing it over all gamma in SL2z. However, I want to claim that this is not the right thing to do. And the reason it's not the right thing to do is that this sum diverges like crazy, but it diverges like crazy for a kind of stupid reason. And the stupid reason that it diverges like crazy is the following. When c is equal to 0 and d is equal to 1, this action does nothing. In other words, the weight k action of the modular group is just equal to 1 on 1 when c equals 0 and d is equal to 1. And if I have an element of SL2z with c equals 0 and d equals 1, it has to have determinant 1, so that implies that a equals 1. That is, elements of the modular group of this form do nothing to the function 1. And what is this? Well, remember t is the element 1, 1, 0, 1, which takes tau to tau plus 1. So this element is simply the beef power of t. So 
So some fairly standard notation. I will let gamma stand denote the modular group SL2Z. And I will let gamma infinity denote the set of elements of the modular group that are simply powers of t, gamma infinity. So gamma infinity, all the elements of SL2z of this form, which are powers of t, do nothing to 1. So in other words, gamma infinity stabilizes the function 1. It just takes it to itself. So if I wanted to average the weight uh, 2k action of the modular group on the function 1, it would make sense not to sum over all elements in the modular group, but to sum over all elements in the modular group mod the action of those elements that don't do anything to 1. They, if I included those, I would just have an infinite number of terms that do nothing. And so I get a divergence just from a sum that's not changing the form of 1. So I should just divide by that because it doesn't do anything other than give me an annoying divergence. So we will define E2k of tau to be this. And um, if I want to write this out slightly more explicitly, I'm summing over all elements in SL2z modulo those that are in gamma infinity C tau plus D to the minus 2k. This is the explicit formula, but conceptually this is what I'm doing. I'm taking the function 1, I'm defining this weight 2k action of the modular group, and I'm summing over everything in the modular group modulo those things that leave 1 invariant. So it's averaging a function over a group with a particular action of the group. The action of the group is this weight 2k action. Um, I guess it's conventional to think of it as acting on the left. Yeah. So I... It's... Um, yeah, I think at least it seems to me that whenever physicists have some uh, subgroup H of a group G and they want to consider cosets or if it's a normal subgroup they want to consider this group they usually write things like this whereas mathematicians usually try to be more specific about whether the action is a right action or a left action and often um, we'll have you know things like this where this is some kind of discrete subgroup and this is some group and this is some compact subgroup or you know so yeah so I'm just I guess I'm following mathematical uh, convention All right, now this is still a little bit unwieldy because we have to figure out what the, you know, if we actually wanted to do this sum, we have to figure out what gammas are in this quotient. Um, but that's not too hard to do. So, I want to show you, so the claim that I want to prove is that E2k of tau is also equal to one half 
the sum on integers c and d such that their greatest common divisor is equal to 1, 1 over c tau plus d to the 2k. So in other words, I claim that this sum over SL2z mod, this gamma infinity subgroup, is equivalent to this sum. And um, basically what that involves is the following. So first of all, let me consider the action of, so this is an element of gamma infinity, this is an element of SL2z, and this gives me A plus NC plus DN and D. So that means that an element in gamma and an element where I've acted with an element of gamma infinity on an element of gamma have the same lower row, that is C and D are the same after I multiply on the left by an element of gamma infinity. Yeah. I'm about, that's what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I need to do this rewriting and then I will explain that. And it's also true that if gamma prime, which is A prime, B prime, C, D, and gamma are both in gamma with the same bottom row, then gamma prime is equal to T to the N gamma for some n, and the proof of that is simply that if I compute a prime minus a d minus b prime minus b c, that's equal to a prime d minus b prime c minus AD minus BC, which is the determinant of gamma prime minus the determinant of gamma is equal to uh, zero, where this is gamma prime and this is gamma. But since AD minus BC is equal to one, C and D have to be relatively prime or else that couldn't be true. And therefore, since C and D are relatively prime, and this combination of D and C gives me zero, it must be that A prime minus A and B prime minus B is equal to N D, or N C and D for some integer N. And that's exactly the statement that gamma prime is equal to t to the n gamma that I got over there. So in other words, they have the same bottom row if they are equal up to an action of gamma infinity, and that's an if and only if statement. So that basically is what we needed to show. Um, Okay, so then the next thing is exactly what you were asking about. What is the relationship? And the relationship between D, G2K and E2K 
is simply that G2K of tau is equal to twice times the Riemann zeta function of 2K times E2K of tau. So once we show that, then we will have established my claim that the Eisenstein series, which appeared in the Taylor series expansion of the Weierstrass function, can be constructed up to some you know, numerical factor by this principle of averaging over a group, because these E2Ks we constricted explicitly by averaging the function 1 over the weight 2K action of SL2Z. Um, and this is really just kind of a one live demonstration, I guess. So, um, well, not quite one line, but almost one line. So let's go back to the definition of G2K. This was the sum prime n tau plus m to the 2k. Um, given any two integers n and m, which are non-zero, there is some integer p, which is the greatest common divisor of m and n. And we can always write m is equal to p times c and n is equal to p times d with c and d relatively prime by pulling out that greatest common divisor. And so in the sum on, sorry? Uh, so, uh, uh, GCD of M and N, I guess I'm also using the notation M N for that, and it's the greatest common divisor. So in other words, if I have two integers, I can always pull out their greatest common divisor. And once I divide the numbers m and n by their greatest common divisor, I end up with two other integers which are relatively prime. Uh, what I mean, right, so this is just a, another notation for the greatest common divisor. So round bracket c d equals 1 is the same as saying the greatest common divisor of c and d is equal to 1. I, I just, I'm using them, that notation kind of interchangeably. My, yeah, uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm sometimes just writing m parentheses m comma n to mean the greatest common divisor of m and n. Um, right, so once I pull that out, I'm left with two integers which are, have greatest common divisor one, that is they're relatively prime. So um, this sum on integers, which are not both zero, can, by doing this, I can always pull out their greatest common divisor. And once I do that, I have a sum on integers, C and D, which are relatively prime, greatest common divisor is equal to 1. And then pulling out this factor of p to the 2k, But the sum on p, um, 1 over p to the 2k, is uh, equal to the Riemann zeta function of 2k.
Okay, so these two are the same thing up to this factor. Usually in the physics literature, you see the E two Ks. I guess it's just a question of you know which you want to use. They differ by this zeta function, a factor of two. Um, anyway, th these are maybe a little nicer just because of this way of thinking about them in terms of averaging over a group. Now, I wanted to derive the Fourier series expansion of these quantities. So E2K of tau is periodic in tau with period one from its transformation law. So you can write a Fourier series in Q equals e to the 2 pi i tau. And working this out is fairly straightforward. And given that there are only about five minutes or so left, um, I think what I'll do is just outline what you need to do, and then uh, leave the details up to you. So let me um, remind you that we had the following. From the expansion of the cotangent of pi z, which I'll now think of as pi tau, we had that the sum of 1 over tau plus n, with the particular way of ordering that we chose, had a Fourier exper series of this form. So that was a previous equation. So take minus 1 to the k minus 1 over k minus 1 factorial d by d tau to the k minus 1 of both sides of this equation. And well, you can take derivatives as well or probably better than I can. And if you do that, you will find You'll find a formula which is known as the Lipschitz formula. Mm. And then in G2K of tau. We can write this as the term where n is equal to 0, which just gives us a Riemann zeta function. And then we have all the terms where n is not equal to 0.
And then we can use the Lipschitz formula to write the Fourier expansion of this term. And if you do those two things, and also use the fact that the Riemann zeta function can be written in terms of some numbers called Bernoulli numbers. find that G2K of tau is equal to 2 pi i to the 2K, 2K minus 1 factorial times mean minus B2K over 2K plus a N equals 1 to infinity, sum R equals 1 infinity 2k by r to the 2k minus 1 q to the rn. And finally, you can take this sum, and by reordering things, you can write it as a sum where you just have powers of Q to a single power where sigma 2K minus 1 of M is the sum over the divisors of M raised to the 2k minus 1 power. And if you uh, you pull out the, the powers that relate G2K and E2K, you'll find that these uh, Eisenstein series E2K always have Fourier expansions that start with one, which is why they're a little bit nicer in some ways. Okay, so just to recap, we said we had this general idea of averaging a function over a group G, and we managed to do this to get trig functions, elliptic functions, and then finally, a particular class of modular functions, which uh, are these holomorphic Eisenstein series. So what um, I'll do next time is to explain a few contexts where these particular uh, modular forms arise in a slightly more physical context. Um, 
I'll talk a little bit about more about the structure of the modular group and the upper half plane and fundamental domains, things like that. Um, and then I think talk a little bit about more general theta functions. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about Jacobi forms at some point. And um, then eventually we'll try to get to a little bit of mock modular forms. But I must say that in looking over the lectures, I realized that my most ambitious plan probably is more like for 16 hours of lectures rather than 12 hours of lectures. So I'm going to have to cut a little bit here and there or maybe not cover quite a, as much as I'd wanted on mock modular forms. But anyway, we'll see how we go and see how far we can get. And um, so I'll see you tomorrow.